Welcome to River City Church Online. We're so glad that you're joining us here today. If you live in Cambridge and you've been checking us out online for some time, we'd love for you to come in person. And you can do that. Just head over to our website and you can find our location. Our website is www.rivercitychurch.org. And if you want to know more information about River City Church, click on Contact Us. We'd love to connect with you sometime this week. All right, we're gonna head into today's message with our pastor, and we're so excited again that you're here. Let's get into God's word, and let's find out how we can follow Jesus, love others, and welcome all. Discover, connect, and grow with River City Church. Today's guest speaker is Nick Kipri. I've come to know Pastor Darrell over the last couple of years pretty good, and we, we just seem to hit it off well. So I was delighted when he invited me to, to, uh, to come and share what God has put on my heart. And um, yeah, it, the, the sermon title is The Best Offense is a Good Defense. Oftentimes that's related to sport. I often relate things to sport, but really it's got to do with the traps that Satan puts out to try and lure us away from God. Satan is on a mission to get back at God. He doesn't like God, so he wants to trap us and lure us away from what is most precious to God, and that is us. So I'm gonna start with the reading of Psalm 124. Psalm 124. That's a song of David, and this is how it reads. If the Lord had not been our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been our side, on our side when the people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us. The flood would have engulfed us, the torrent would have swept over us, and the raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I don't have it on? Okay. There we go. I trust that everyone heard the first part. <laughs> I don't have one of those really soft, tame voices, so. Anyways. Every New Year's, a lot of people are in the habit of uh, making New Year's resolutions. How many people here make New Year's resolutions or have made New Year's resolutions in the past? You get a bit older. I used to do that and do better at school and all those things, but I didn't do very good at school. That didn't seem to work for me. But anyways, Time Magazine did a study on it uh, a few years ago. And in the States, they determined about 40 percent of people make New Year's resolutions. And when they revisited those 40 people, it was determined only 8 percent said that they were successful in what they had set out to be. So top five. Number one is? Lose weight. Lose weight. Number two was be more organized. Three was spend less and save more. Number four was live life to the fullest. And five, stay fit and healthy. And you can't really argue against any one of them that there's anything wrong with them, but they are all focused on me, 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 me. There's none about us or relationships or anything like that. So I'm going to present a challenge out there that's focused on me, 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 me as well. And it's sort of based on a... Uh, devotional I heard at a, at a recent men's conference that I attended. Um, it was led by a pastor, Dave, from Vancouver. I don't know what his last name is, but um, some of the stories in here are ones that he had shared, so I'll give him the credit for that. But the challenge that he threw out was, how about we challenge ourselves to be better defenders, be a master defender? Now, you kind of say, what is that supposed to mean, being a master defender? Well, I'm going to explain this, because in Colossians 2, 6 to 8, it speaks of spiritual fullness in Christ. It says, starting at verse 6, So then, 
just as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. And this is the key thing. See it, see to it that no one takes you captive. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. See, Paul's letter to the Christians in the Colossian church came at a time when they were starting to sign up to some heretical philosophies rather than to stick into the gospel of salvation through faith. Now, to be fair to the Colossian church, they didn't have the Bible to always refer back to. So it was important that the apostles like Paul would visit there regularly and write to them critiquing what, what they were going through as a church and kind of getting them back on the, on the right path. So he's warning them, don't get caught up in these heretical philosophies. They are not from God, they are from the enemy. So rather, build up your defense so you can detect those traps. Get caught up in Christ and his salvation through grace because he is always on your side. And in our scripture reading this morning, David says pretty much the same thing. He can't emphasize strongly enough to the Israelite nation that if God had not been on their side, they would have been done. The enemy was far more than they could handle. The enemy troops were a lot bigger. They were armed to the teeth. They were stronger. They had everything that they needed. And Israel, their tiny little army was, was, was very meager and, and weak. But King David knew that they had God on their side. And that is how he went in with such confidence. Think about it. King David, they, they say he was probably under five feet tall because that was the average height back then. Now the average height is, is much more. But Goliath stood at almost seven feet. And he went in there with no fear because he knew he had God on his side. Now that is real faith, not just head faith. Because oftentimes we will say, yeah, I have a strong faith. I believe without a doubt that there's God. But a man of God tells you, go and kill that guy that's like two feet taller than you. How many people are going to step into that one? So he was one that had heart faith. He believed it through and through with his heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, because your own understanding would be, that guy's going to beat the crap out of me. But in all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. And that's what he certainly did for the little shepherd boy, King David. So he gives God thanks. He gives God the glory. He gives God the credit. Praise be to God who freed them from the trap. He, set, he broke the snare and set them free. He was, is, and always will be more powerful than any trap. And again in 1 Peter, Peter addresses the Christians being persecuted under Emperor Nero in Asia Minor, and he encourages them to be caught up by Christ. He encourages them to be caught up by Christ, but warns them that Satan is always prowling around, seeking to devour somebody. And in today's world, things are no different. Satan is still prowling around, seeking to devour somebody. We as Christians have a relationship with Christ, but Satan is still always prowling around, seeking those opportunities when he can devour you, when he can throw chaos into your life. He wants to trap you, and he's got some really cunning traps. So this morning we're going to review some of the traps, but the first thing we've got to review is the three principles that make an effective trap. Now, to make an effective trap, this is a mouse trap, but if you're trying to catch a rat, a rat's going to get that on his finger and he's just going to just flick it off and it's, going to, it ain't, it, it's not big enough, so you need an effective trap. This is a a rat trap. Now, I need a volunteer here for a minute. No. <laughs> no, I don't need a volunteer. I just got to make sure I don't become the volunteer here. So the trap has to be stronger than the intended victim. So this is stronger than the rat. This one isn't, but this is. That's principle number one. Number two, it operates on the principle of deceit. So it, it trickery. You have to fool 
the rat. You put some bait in there, and the rat goes, hmm, nice, nice, nice uh, little treat for me out there. And through that deceit, he gets tricked into it because he doesn't see all the mechanics of this rat trap. And then number three, it has to be somebody that knows the way of the victim. Now, I don't know how well a rat sees, but I know with mouse traps, mice see, they have very, very poor eyesight. So you always set it up along a wall because they navigate using their whiskers. So if you set a trap in the middle of a floor, the odds are that a mouse will never step into it. But you set it up along a wall, if there's mice there, that's where they travel because their whiskers just brush along the wall. That's why you always set them up along a wall or along in a narrow channel or something like that. So you have to know the ways of the victim. And as Christians, we are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. We are a threat to what Satan is trying to do because Satan wants to separate God's prized possession. He wants to take that away from God. So as Christians, when we reach out and make a difference in the community and difference in your own lives, we are a threat to his mission. We are a threat to his kingdom. And especially when you as a church are making inroads into the community, getting people that are part of his kingdom and drawing them out into God's kingdom, that's a threat. And he notices that and he just focuses in on that. So he is often setting the trap. But as Satan wrote, God is stronger than any trap and God is on our side. And his example in the, in the scripture reading is of a bird being released from a snare. And that's such a nice example because what better symbol of freedom is there than a bird soaring through the air? Like, because they are, there's nothing that can get them from the air. So God wants to set us free. Psalm 91, 1 says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. God sets us free. So we're going to go through these traps, and the first trap is a trap of tranquility. Now, these are all true stories of uh, how people used to do trapping, and the, uh, the people way up Northwest ter Territories in Alaska, the, uh, the indigenous people, they used to have a knife, like the one shown in a picture, and they would set it outside overnight so it got really super cold, like minus 30 or something, and then they would take it in, dip it in blood, and the blood would right away freeze to it, then they'd put it out again so it would get even colder again, and dip it again, and so on and so on, until it had a big coating of frozen blood on it. Then they would take it out to the path where the wolf would always be traveling, and they would just lay it there. And then they would go away, and then sooner or later the wolf would come by and, hmm, a blood sickle, my favorite. <laughs> so then they start licking the blood off the thing, and they just get right into it. This is so good, and they go crazy, just lick, 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 lick. And you probably all had brain freeze before, right? Or if you're really on an ice cream cone, your tongue almost goes numb. Well, that's what happens to the wolf, too. His tongue goes numb from licking this super frozen blood, and he loses sensation in his tongue, and when he gets through the first layer, like it shows in the picture, that's when he hits the blade, and it cuts his tongue, and he can't feel it because his tongue is numb. And then really, in essence, he is drinking his own blood until he bleeds out and he dies. And that's how they would trap wolves. Now, how do I use that as a uh, trap of tranquility? It's just they get lulled into it. It's like you can put a frog into boiling water. The frog will, boom, he'll jump right out again. But if you put them into warm water, oh, that feels nice warm. Because they're cold-blooded, their body temperature adapts to what's around it. So if you slowly heat it up, they say one, de one Celsius degree every 15 minutes, it continues to feel nice and cozy warm, and they'll stay in it. And you can keep raising temperature all the way up to boiling temperature, and eventually the frog dies. But it just feels good. They're tranquil. They get lulled into this sense of confidence. But Satan uses this trap of tranquility on us as well, too. Because so often we get, we have our career demands. What used to be a 40-hour week is now a 50-hour week. And then we, uh, yeah, we got sports for the kids. And then we got, yeah, social time for ourselves. We go out for dinner twice a week. And other stuff gets sort of pushed to the sides. And it sort of gets we get sort of numb to it. And we put off 
the more important spiritual disciplines, you know, our own personal devotions, prayer time, reading scripture or reading books that, that, that will point you in that direction. When I heard his devotion, it was uh, Pastor Dave. He, he, he shared a story, because his first charge was in uh, Saskatchewan, and when he got called there, he was just young, so they moved into an apartment building, and when they uh, settled in, they, they, they noticed very quickly that those walls were paper thin and you could hear everything going on in everybody's apartment. Well, the people right next door to them, they, uh, they did not get along real well. There was a lot of fighting and yelling and even throwing things around. And he always kept thinking, oh man, I should really go over there sometime and just talk to him. But yeah, life was just too busy. But it was just busy with the things that make our lives busy. They weren't that important. Then one day he said, you know what? I've got to talk to them. So he went there with his wife, Sue, and um, they went to see the neighbor there, um, Paul and Deb, that was the name of the neighbor. And they said, uh, yeah, we moved in next door and yeah, we can sort of hear what's going on. It doesn't sound like things are real good here. You know, you know, I'm a pastor, we can chat about things. Yeah, that would probably be good. We're, I don't know, we're considering getting separated. This is not working out real good. So. Pastor Dave had his wife Sue leave with Deb and then he sat down and talked to Paul. They talked about relationships and, and they started sharing their faith. And long story short, after about a year, they started coming to church regularly and they gave their lives to Christ. They got their marriage back on track and they lived happily ever after, like every good story ends. But the thing is, it's so easy to get lulled into it and say, you know, those are my neighbors, that's their problem. I'm busy with this and this and this and you leave God's kingdom work, you leave it be. But he stole these people from Satan's kingdom of darkness, brought them into God's kingdom. Next, I have the trap of trends. And this is another one that the First Nations used for, for hunting, so to speak, and it was for catching ducks. What they would do if there was a flock of ducks, there is a flock of ducks, right? Or is it a, it's not a herd. I, I'm going to go with flock. In the river, they would go upstream of where the ducks were, and they'd fire a pumpkin into the river. So this pumpkin would just come bobbing down the river, and all of a sudden the ducks go, whoa, big orange monster. Wah! So they would fly high into the tree and watch this thing just float by harmlessly. Okay, that wasn't so bad. Next day, same time, same thing. Throw the pumpkin back in and all of a sudden a duck, oh yeah, there's that orange monster again. So they quickly fly to shore. Next day, here comes that orange thing again. Ah, we'll just swim off to the side. After about a week, they didn't even bat an eye. It's just that orange thing just floated on by. Then the next day, they would carve out the bottom and they would be, have their head in it and then they would be swimming with this on their head right past the duck, and then from underwater, they could grab the ducks. That's how they would trap them. But how is that a trap for us? Things happen in this world, and they can repeat, 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 until we get used to it. The things we see on movies now, or how easy gambling is to do online, on your, on your phone, during a game, um, language on the street, stuff that gets taught in schools. If that happened 50 years ago in one shot, there would have been a huge outcry. This cannot be, this cannot happen. But they just slowly lull you into accepting it. They slowly lull you into accepting it. But the good news is God is more powerful and he can set us free from those traps, but we have to recognize those traps. Then I got the Trap of treasure. And for that, we go to Southeast Asia where monkeys are plentiful. And it is widely accepted that the rhesus monkey is the smartest monkey there is. Now, the rhesus monkey has got one glaring weakness, and it causes the monkey a lot of trouble. But they have such a love for bananas that once they get a banana in their hand, they will not let go. So they set traps similar to this, 
but it's attached down so the monkey can't run off with the trap. It's attached like this, and once they got the banana, then the people that are trying to catch the monkey will run out, and he won't let go, but he can't get his hand out because it's around the banana, and then he just catch the monkey. So how can that be a trap for us? Well, Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Mark 8, 36, what would it profit a man if he gains a whole world but loses his soul? We are very fortunate to live where we do here in Canada. We are very much blessed. And having great financial resources can be a real blessing because we can do great works with them, but it can also be a real curse. It can also be a real curse. It's a potential for a very effective trap for Satan. Pastor Dave, in his uh, address, he uh, referenced a guy from Saskatchewan that was in his church, and he was in the oil industry, and that was a time when oil was really going up fast in price. He was in oil exploration, and they had a few real promising prospects, so he was working seven days a week from when he woke up to when he went to bed, and he was making a pile of money. He showed off his brand new pickup truck and the boat and his big cottage he just bought on the on a lake, and he was kind of boasting to the pastor today, but I'd see, man, this job is so good. I'm really getting paid well. But then when Pastor Dave, so how's it going with the family? A kind of a tear came in the guy's eye. And he said, well, that's the part that's not going so good. They don't like me working this much. My wife wants to separate. So you see what happens. Our world would say that he hasn't made he hasn't made, he's got all the money he wants. But Satan is clubbing him to death in relationships. Not only with his family, but more importantly, his relationship to God. Because he had filled up his time with the pursuit of treasure. With the pursuit of treasure. People on their deathbed, when they have their last words to family or whoever, they will never say, man, I should have worked on my career harder. I should never have retired at 60. I should have gone to 70. They're way more often saying things like, man, I should have worked on my relationships more. I shouldn't have been so focused on, you know, working up that corporate ladder. Being on a deathbed brings about amazing clarity for a lot of people. It's amazing how clear they can get. But God will set us free from that trap and any other trap. Then we have the final trap, the trap of transgression. It's a bit different, but it's very, very deadly. It holds a victim in bondage of past sins and transgressions. Now I'm gonna first share the story about A.J. Gordon, Dr. A.J. Gordon. He was, uh, lived just over 100 years ago, and he was a Baptist preacher, he was a professor, a theologian, he had even, um, started a theological seminary, and he was uh, very much in demand for preaching and his professor stuff, but that, saw, that found him behind a desk a lot. And as is the case with a lot of professional people, that's not me at all, I always worked out in the field in construction, heavy construction, but for people that work behind a desk, they seem to want to just, for a break, they just want to work physically, work hard and something brain dead. Uh, so this Dr. A.J. Gordon, he loved to work in his garden. Didn't take much brain thought, but he could just work and just, it was food for the mind, just sort of just relax, chill a bit. So every day he'd work for half an hour in a garden or so. So the one day he's out gardening and he noticed in a, in a field behind, a, behind his garden this little boy walking out of the, out of the forest and he's got, he's got this... Uh, bird cage in hand and he sees something in there so he says hey there young fellow what do you got there he says well I set a trap and I caught me a sparrow a sparrow you say what are you going to do with them ah I don't know I might feed them to my cat <laughs> so Dr. Gordon being a real bird lover like bird watching he just loved birds they were always in his garden and stuff he says oh my goodness he says you can't feed them to your cat he says well He's mine, I caught him. So 
I mean, it's just a sparrow. It's not like a falcon or an eagle or something. That's yeah, still a bird, though, goes A.J. Gordon. Tell you what, I'll give you five bucks for him. The kid says, five bucks? And this is like 100 years ago when it was like offering 200 bucks would be now. So he says, you're nuts. But if you want to part with it, five bucks, I'll gladly take it. You can have the cage, too. So the boy skips off with an extra spring in his step, really delighted in his newfound wealth. And Dr. Gordon, he, uh, he's, he, he sets a cage on a, on a table in the garden, and he opens the door, kind of, okay, bird, you can, you can leave now, but the bird is shaking. He's got a bit of blood coming from him. The kid had been pestering him with a stick already and stuff, too. But the bird was so scared, he wouldn't, get, he wouldn't even move toward, he was just cowering in the back corner. So Dr. Gordon backs up a bit, and finally the bird takes one hop a bit closer to the door, and finally he hops out to the door and flies away to freedom. It can be like that way with us too. Sometimes we're trapped by Satan. Sometimes he's tempted us to do things that we know we shouldn't be doing, but he's got us tempted. But like Dr. Gordon paid for the bird, Christ paid for us. Christ bought us with his blood. And he has set us free from the clutches of Satan. But some people have a really tough time accepting that. Nothing is for free, right? Some people have a really tough time accepting that. Can this really be true? Am I really free? Does God know all the sins I've done? I've done some really hideous things. Has, has all that stuff been covered by his blood? There was a time about 20 years ago, I was serving in church council at the time, and we had one of the more senior members of our church, and he'd been a great member for many, many years. I went to Christian school with our kids and stuff, and he was nearing death. He was a very sick man, but still very much of sound mind, and he was beside himself with grief, thinking that he had done too many bad things, because he lived life full, and he did a lot of things that people would say, wow, I don't know if we should be doing that, but anyways, on his deathbed, he was really beside himself with grief, thinking, man, I made some really bad decisions. I knew they were wrong, but I went and did them anyways. Am I still really forgiven? And only after repeated visits from our pastor did he totally and fully accept that, yes, Christ died for all my sins. And he was free of that anxiety, free of that stuff that kept him so uptight. So the good news is that God sets us free once again. But that doesn't mean that we should continue just getting trapped and say, well, God's going to just spring me out of that trap again, time and time again. We shouldn't be getting trapped in the first place. So there's work to be done at not allowing that to happen. We need to be smarter than the one setting the traps, because Satan is very cunning. He knows the way of the, he knows our ways. He knows where we might get trapped. Like you guys all know now, being a Packers fan, I, I love watching football. And the typical week for a football player is they play Sundays usually, or Thursday nights or Monday nights, but they play once a week. Then on a Monday, they're sort of resting up from their injuries and from being tired and stuff, but they watch tape. They watch miles and miles of tape of the next opposition, the next team they're going to face the following week. What are they good at? How can we attack them? What, how are they going to attack us? How do we defend against what they can do? And they really study the opposition. Now, in this metaphor, you could say the enemy, because they're the ones that they want to beat. How will we beat them? All through school, I was never an academic. I hated English. I hated reading. I still don't like reading one bit. But I did read one book by C.S. Lewis, Screw Tape Letters. Anybody here read the? OK, lots of people read that book. OK, well, that's the only C.S. Lewis book I read. But it was, I thought it was awesome. And it's, it's about screw tape, a senior demon sort of taking a junior demon, uh, Wormwood, a junior demon, uh, under his wing and training him how to draw people away from God's kingdom 
So he was assigned to this guy and said, what is that guy's weakness? Has he got a weakness for alcohol, drugs? Has he got a weakness for women? Does he have a weakness for overspending? What's his weakness? And when you find out what that weakness is, that's the buttons we'll push. That's the buttons we'll push. So, if you reflect back on your life, what are the buttons that Satan's pushing in your life? What are your weaknesses? What are your weak tendencies that can draw you away from God? You know what's wrong, but you can't help it. And are you still trapped in that? Are you still trapped? What is that trap that you have a tough time defending against? Is it pride? Is it lust or greed, envy, gambling, gossip, gluttony, pornography, substance abuse, or maybe just busyness in life? Or maybe it's unforgiven sin. Maybe it's a, something that happened way long ago that you don't, it's kind of buried, you don't even want to talk about it. Maybe it's time to revisit that. But the good news, the gospel truth is that we have a compassionate God that is mighty to save, and he is more powerful than any trap. Amen, Amen to that indeed. He will set you free. If you, ideally we don't get trapped, but when we do get trapped, spring that trap open. We... God is all-powerful. He can move mountains. There are some influential people. Um, Bruxy Cavey. Who knows Bruxy Cavey from uh, Meeting House? Things didn't work out real well for him. And a lot of people will right away say, how could he let that happen? How could he let that happen? There's also youth pastors in our own classes that, that, that have gotten caught in very in things that should never have happened, and they had to leave the ministry. People say, how could they let that happen? I don't think a lot of people know how much spiritual warfare Satan fires at them because they're being effective at bringing people to Christ. Bruxy Cavey brought a lot of people to know Christ. Satan was attacking him relentlessly. So yes, it's easy to jump down his throat and how could you let that happen? We don't know what temptation he had to face. Everyone's got a weakness for something, and Satan was just hammering away on him because that was, if he could take him down, man, you can take a lot of people down. So the important thing is the best offense is a good defense. We better defend against it before we get trapped into it. Jesus rose, and he conquered the grave. He defeated sin. He defeated all traps. And while the battles continue on, the war has been won. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you at the end of this message. Lord, we thank you for being our God. We thank you that you have defeated the enemy. We thank you that we are yours, but Lord, we also know that even though you have won the war, we know that the battles still rage on, and they will rage on until you come back in glory someday. And Lord, we look forward to that day. But in the meantime, Lord, we just pray that you help us see your traps and that we talk to you through prayer and that we dialogue with you through prayer. And Lord, that through the help of your Holy Spirit, we can defeat the enemy and that we can defend against the trap so that we may be on a mission to become better defenders. Lord, we pray it all in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for checking us out today. We hope that you will join us here on YouTube or in person next week to continue our study of God's Word. It would be really helpful if you could like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribing is one of the best ways to stay connected with our church as we journey together in our study of God's Word and growing to be more like Jesus Christ. If you have questions about your faith, please go to our website, rivercitychurch.org, and click on the Contact Us tab. We would love to hear from you and learn how we can serve you better. We exist in this community because of generous support from donors like you. If you would like to support this ministry because you were blessed by what you heard today, please go to our website, rivercitychurch.org, and click on the Giving tab. There'll be all kinds of options there for you where you can give to support 
our ministry in Cambridge, Ontario. Have a great week. I hope that God surprises you with his love today and every day. Thanks for watching.